Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a chance to have your lunch uh, during this very short break. Uh, I am Ari Shekharian, one of the Manugian postdoctoral fellows during this academic year, together with, with Dr. Alex McFarlane at the Center for the Armenian Studies uh, at the Uni University of Michigan. Uh, welcome to the final session of our two-day workshop entitled From Empire to Nation State, the Ottoman Armistice, Imagined Borders and Displaced Populations, 1918-1923. First of all, again, I want to personally thank the Center for Army Studies for this opportunity. I want to thank Professor Ronald Suni and Professor Melanie Tanelian for their guidance in organizing this workshop and also for their feedback uh, on my paper. I must thank Naira Tumanyan, our program coordinator, who made this virtual workshop happen behind the scenes. I would like to extend my gratitude to all of the workshop participants, Dr. Alpianen, Dr. Daniel Joseph MacArthur Seal, Aishinur Korkmaz, Professor Erda Göknar, Ararat Shekaryan, Dr. Gizem Tongo, our keynote speaker, Professor Ryan Gingeras, commentator for the second session, Professor William Strobel, and the chair of the second session, Professor Michael Piper, for kindly accepting our invitation. It would have been amazing if we could have this workshop here in Ann Arbor, uh, but the situation of the global pandemic forced us to do this virtually here on Zoom. Before beginning my short introduction, I want to let the public audience know that they can send their questions through the Q&A button at the, top of, at the bottom of their screens. <clears throat> I will begin with a short introduction, uh, then give the floor to Professor Tanyelian, who will deliver her comments on yesterday's session. Then I will turn to workshop participants in order for them to add their comments and uh, questions. And in the end, we will take questions and comments uh, from the audience, from the public audience. So when I was studying for my master's degree at Boğaziçi University in Istanbul in 2013, I took a course on the armistice period titled uh, Istanbul under Allied Occupation, uh, taught by the late Yavuz Selim Karakışla. Unfortunately, we lost him a few years ago. Even though there was an extensive list of reading material for the course, there was no reading about the Ottoman Armenians. When I asked Professor Karakışla about this, he said, um, there is no study dealing with Armenians during the armistice array. Uh, at least I couldn't find uh, I couldn't find one. Basically, such a study was absent at that time. My interest in the armistice years grew during the subsequent years, and I ended up writing a PhD thesis on the armistice period and Armenian community. From a methodological point of view, I know that it doesn't sound right and problematic to divide historiogra historiography into such into two, such as Ottoman Turkish historiography and Armenian historiography. But I will do this now to better explain uh, to our audience about the state of art regarding this special period. It is well known that in the, Armenian, uh, in the Ottoman Turkish historiography, the armistice period has been mostly ignored, with the emphasis being placed on the war of independence and the Turkish national movement in Anatolia which ultimately resulted in the establishment of the Republic of Turkey. On the other hand, when you look at the Armenian historiography, the vast majority of academic works have focused on the Armenian genocide of 1915 and leaving the post-war Armenian community insufficiently explored. The Turkish historiography has mostly employed Turkish language sources, while the Armenian historiography has similarly relied upon Armenian and some Western language sources. Only a few scholars were uh, kind of bridging these Ottoman Turkish and Armenian sources in their work. The existing official uh, Ottoman Turkish narrative lacks reflection on the multi-dimensional nature of this critical period in which an empire collapsed and the nation state arose. Republic of Turkey. Uh, the state endorsed academic works, particularly organized by the Turkish Historical Association, 
<coughs> Türk Tarih Kurumu generally comments with the narrative of the landing of Mustafa Kemal in Samsun in May 1919, which later became accepted as the beginning of the War of Independence. The armistice period in Turkish official narrative begins with the emergence of the Turkish national movement in Ankara and then ends with the Turkish victory against Yedi Duvel, literally the seven continents, uh, thus the whole world. I am sure this workshop makes a contribution towards enhancing a critical approach in Turkish historiography by highlighting the many factors influencing the period. In official Turkish narrative, uh, the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire are portrayed as traitors, supporters of the Antant, uh, allied powers, and therefore deserving of exclusion from official narrative. So conversely, Armenian historiography has either focused on the newly established Republic of Armenia in the Caucasus, or studied the Ottoman Armenians of the armistice period within the framework of the genocide. Thus, the armistice period had been included in the genocide history books to show the continuity of the process. Yet there is rare mention in the Armenian historiography of the Turkish intellectuals who openly condemned the CUP leaders, calling them, quote unquote, traitors of the nation, Vatan Aini, because of their crimes against humanity inflicted, inflicted upon the Armenian population. The fascinating book of Ryan Gingeras, Sorrowful Shores, Violence, Ethnicity, and the End of the Ottoman Empire, 1912-1923, provides insights into the armistice period, especially in terms of shaping the dominant approach, the dominant traditional approach in Turkish historiography by exploring the opposition movement against the Kemalist forces in the South Marmara region. Professor Gingeras demonstrates in his book that not all strata of Muslim Turkish society provided open support to the Ankara government. This fact has been overlooked in the traditional Turkish narrative because the Turkish national movement has been considered to be the founding body of modern Turkish society and has been presented uh, as a shared vision that united all Anatolian Muslims, regardless of their ethnic origin. So Jinjaras fills a gap in modern Turkish historiography by examining how Muslim minorities, such as the Albanians, Caucasians, conducted counter-revolutionary activities against the nationalist forces. In recent years, early, Republic, early Republican period has been an area of interest for a few scholars contributing to the history of Armenian community in Turkey. Here I must state, Lerna Ekmekçoğlu's book, Recovering Armenia, The Limits of Belonging in Post-Genocide Turkey, which is published by the Stanford University Press in 2016, is a pioneering work on the armistice and Republican periods. Professor Ekmekçoğlu, who was also a former postdoctoral fellow here at University of Michigan, analyzes the period of 1918-1935, focusing on the post-war Armenian community in Istanbul. She regards gender as, I quote, an analytical tool and the site of discourse through which the post-genocide Armenian community in Istanbul perceived and organized itself, end quote. In addition to Lerna's work, I should also state the works of three Armenian women scholars Armavini Miroğlu's work on the first decade of the Turkish Republic, Sirvat Malhasyan's master thesis on Turkish Armenian Ascent, Ascent Association, Turk Armenian Theology Committee, and Professor Talin Sujian's book, Armenians in Modern Turkey. These works also focus on the early Republican years and the Armenian community in Istanbul. So what about this workshop? Uh, where this workshop stands between these, um, let's say, two uh, historiographies, two narratives, in this workshop, we aim to bring scholars working on different aspects of the post-war period and whose works, I believe, challenge these already established uh, historiographies, these already established uh, narratives. Um, Daniel's paper focused on investigating the occupation's impact uh, on subaltern Istanbulites, which has been hitherto neglected in the literature. Daniel demonstrates how the First World War brought displacement and debt to families, depriving them of male earners, resulting in an increase in women working in, uh, in the brothels in Istanbul. Alp's paper showed the interesting post-war story of the CUP leaders who fled the country 
following the signing of Armistice of Mudros. I totally agree with the Alps, uh, Alps argument uh, I quote here. Um, although the response of the Young Turk regime to, the quest to this question resulted in Armenian genocide of 1915, the Armenian question was still unresolved at the end of the war with culprits unpunished, survivors and refugees dispersed across territories and the new but tender Armenian Republic in the Caucasus." End quote. Obviously, uh, the Armenian question continued to exist after the First World War, and particularly during the Armistice years at the Paris Peace Conference, even at the Lausanne Conference, when the establishment of Armenian home for, ref for refugees was still on the table. So the Armenian question <clears throat> continued to be exist after the Armenian genocide of 1915. So uh, even we think about, if we think about the situation of Armenian refugees scattered around the world, the Armenian question was alive even during the subsequent decades following uh, 1923. Uh, Aishinur's paper focused on the story of uh, Ottoman Armenian refugees in Soviet Armenia and the concept of Yergir, homeland, based on an extensive fieldwork in Armenia and primary and secondary, secondary sources, Aishinur demonstrates how the concept of Yergir among the Ottoman Armenian refugees changed and uh, shaped and reshaped in 1930s, 50s, and 60s in Soviet Armenia. Erdas' paper focused on the legacy of the aftermaths of the 1918-20 military tribunals for the late Ottoman crimes against the Armenian population, the legacy of the partition of Ottoman lands and the destruction of Ottoman uh, cosmopolitanism. His paper analyzes the cultural legacies of legal processes at the intersection of political violence, law, and literature. Arad's paper focused on the poetry of, Os of Osip Mandelstein and the responses to the 1920 sushi massacres in literary works. He demonstrates how the concept of collective responsibility, Krugovaya Poruka, if I'm pronouncing it right, in Soviet Armenia uh, forced the Armenians to submit themselves to the collective responsibility of forgetting. For example, Soviet Armenian author Mariata Shainyan wrote about the Sushi massacre, but she blamed both Tashnaks and Musavatists in alignment with the Soviet official discourse. Gizem's paper focused on the politics of cultural memory surrounding the visual representation of the First World War and the genocide in occupied Istanbul. As she states, unlike the remembrance of the First World War in Western Europe as a soldier's conflict, in occupied Istanbul, war was imagined and remembered primarily as a civilian's war. And I think this aspect has also been neglected in recent historiography, and Gizem's work contributes to uh, filling this gap. <clears throat> I think that all, the pap all of the papers presented in this workshop have brought new perspectives to the armistice period. And I am glad we have come together for this workshop and shared our work in progress. But I should also mention that it is, it is, uh, it is my fault not to invite someone working, for example, on the Ottoman Kurds during the armistice, uh, Egyptians, uh, Lebanese, uh, Jews, uh, Greeks, and also Assyrians. Uh, perhaps the next step uh, could be to bring these scholars together uh, for, uh, for, for a conference, perhaps, on the armistice in the Middle East. Not also, not only in uh, Ottoman lands, not not only in the Anatolian uh, land, like Anatolian Muslims and Armenians, but also the other uh, ethnic groups: uh, Kurds, uh, Lebanese, Jews, Greeks, and Assyrians. So, unfortunately, because of the time limit, uh, Professor Tanyelian was not able to deliver uh, her comments on the first uh, session yesterday uh, for our uh, for our session uh, on the history of the Armistice period. So now I want to give the floor to Professor uh, Tanya Lian uh, for her uh, comments and feedback. Thank you so much, Ari, for, for setting up the roundtable in such a beautiful way and also for potentially giving us some future direction and thinking about this particular time period. 
um, in the broader sense of the Ottoman Empire and bringing in other minority groups, I think that's a really um, admirable step and I would be very supportive of that. As you know, I, I work in, uh, in the Arab provinces. Um, so, of course, this is a, a particular time period that is super fascinating and I wanted to thank everyone for their beautiful engagement and their beautiful papers. I learned a lot and I think there's lots more work um, to do as uh, Ryan so beautifully outlined for us yesterday. I, um, I, I'm hoping to keep my comments short. I, I am mostly interested in trying to think of what does the Armenian case contribute to larger conversations? So, I, and I think Erda has, um, has opened for us a space uh, already to think about uh, what I'm going to, to get at. Um, and it is very related to the kind of work that I do. So it may, may seem, seem very particular, but I hope that this might be helpful in thinking about this time period also in larger contexts. So reading your works, I kept coming back, as I said yesterday already, to this term internationalism. And we often work in our respective fields, uh, overlook this new internationalism that really marks this period. And here, as I also mentioned already yesterday, I don't mean the political principle that advocated for greater political and economic cooperation or the international context of military and political alliances or the treaty negotiations that divided, of course, the spoils of war. Um, or of, uh, in, for, for that matter, the unequal treatment of those populations who took in the eyes of the Europeans Wilson's call for self-determination way too serious. But rather, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of internationalism as referring what Erda already put for us on the table, cosmopolitanism. And, I, and of course, there's a larger literature around cosmopolitanism that we would have to take into consideration that which both Will as well as Erda also already mentioned in their comments. But there is something that, that, that I would like to sort of draw out in that, if we view all humans, regardless of their national, ethnic, and racial belongings as part of a single community based on a shared morality, as this cosmopolitanism in this period advocates, and you know, of course, it has uh, colonial, colonialist implication, but it is a, but a vision of course, that would in the sort of post-World War II period give rise to an international human rights regime, which is also paternalistic and colonialist, colonialist in its own right. But as many scholars have argued, of course, that the Declaration of Human Rights uh, did not simply rise uh, like a phoenix from the ashes out of total war in 1948, but rather has a longer history of a shared humanity, quote unquote. We may, of course, um, go back further than 1918 um, as internationalism understood as such uh, may be visible in the attempts at regulating war in the 19th century, an attempt that resulted in drafting of uh, conventions that cross borders like never before, conventions that were inspired by Henry Dunant's recognition that the brutal suffering of armed conflict were not mediated by national nationality. On the contrary, he writes in 1864 that on the floor of hospitals and churches near the battlefields of Soforino lay beside or lay side by side men of all nations, Frenchmen next to Arabs, Germans next to Slav. All had in common, he argues, the bloody wounds inflicted by guns and cannons. The resulting convention solicited from, from its signatories an acknowledgement of this kind of common humanity that I'm trying to get at. So bear with me. So in the post-World War I period, the commitment to establishing international norms for the first time and for the first time an international mechanism that was to enforce these norms was renewed in light of the carnage of this total war. 
Although deeply flawed, and of course we know doomed to fail, we see the beginning of conversations that set the stage for, broader, for a broader utopian vision of a universal human rights regime. And of course, what Erda also already mentioned, a, a, um, a legal, uh, illegal uh, conversation that happens at this particular time. And here, the League of Nations, despite, of course, its ultimate failure, is an important norm setting agency. Some of you use the source materials of the League in your papers, and I cannot emphasize enough the possibility of those sources as they not only reveal new new historical details, as we saw in both Daniel's and Ari's paper, but also open new analytical spaces for us that may position our work into larger global framings. Moreover, this particular depository of sources will allow us to ask a new set of questions and in no small way sort of will highlight what I would argue the centrality of Armenians and questions surrounding Armenians in shaping this international, this sort of new international moral and legal landscape. So the figure of the refugee looms large or loomed large yesterday in, in all of these excellent papers. And whether they were arriving in the Soviet realm, remin reminiscing about the homeland, enter Istanbul to seek a livelihood, experiencing another string of violent destruction on an island that was supposed to be sort of the Isle of Safety, or a set of men, criminals, who sought uh, refuge outside of the empire. The post-war period is an important moment in internationally defining and setting norms in regards to the refugee. And this is where I'm trying to get your papers connected to this larger con conversation. Viewing the work of the League of Nations at the time, it is clear that the international commitment to ameliorate the suffering of displaced people and the construction of an international legal definition of the refugee was driven in part by the needs of the survivors of the Armenian genocide. But who is the refugee? Today, we think of refugees as a category of migrants, migrants having described by the philosopher Thomas Nail as the political figure of our time, a political figure that no doubt conjures up in our minds many, many images, and they're mostly images from the last decade. In this is, of course, a particular kind of refugee stands at the center of our 21st imagination, namely the refugee who occupies crowded shelters across the European continent, those who have crossed borders, escaping violence, genocide, and are first and foremost a vulnerable category of men, women, and children. The discourse of vulnerability and the refugee as an object reliant on assistance of others, Hannah Arendt would write is historical. As she alerts in her essays, essay titled We Refugees, and this was published in 1943, used to be a person uh, or a refugee used to be a person, she argues, that was driven to seek refuge because of some act committed or some political opinion held. And which this in no uncertain term is, of course, how we may understand the dubious figures of Talat, Enver, and Jemal as they are seeking refuge outside of the Ottoman Empire. But Arendt continues that in her time, uh, it is true we have had to seek refuge, but she says we committed no acts, and most of us never dreamt of having any radical opinion, with us the meaning of the term refugee has changed. Now refugees, she says, are those of us who have been unfortunate as to arrive in a new country without means and have to be helped by refugee committees." Unquote. And while she's right that the term of, of refugee has changed, looking at your works, we could easily argue that this change way predates uh, Hannah Arendt's moment in 1943. Indeed, the conviction that the international community of states, rather than individual government or private charitable organization, had a duty to provide refugees with protection and find solution to their problems dates from the times of the League of Nations. Indeed, the League of Nations defined refugees in terms of specific groups of people who were judged to be in danger if they returned home to their countries. The League of Nations' first institutionalization 
action on behalf of refugees took place in 1924, the work was already ongoing when it created the High Commissioner for Russian Refugees and elected Nansen to fill it. So your papers inadvertently show us that the refugee, that refugees were subject to caretaking, regulation and systematic integration as a group that was vulnerable in the context of the interwar period. And if this early conversation shaped the broader discussion of the category and the international legal body that would regulate and legislate the proper dealing and protection of refugees, which is now defined in 1951 as, I quote, a person owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reason of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, who is outside of their country of nationality and is unable to avail themselves of the protection of that country and also unable to return to that country. If that is the definition, and if we can see the sort of interwar moment as shaping, and in particular, the kind of uh, actions and the kind of discourse that we see within your own sort of settings, is it, is it possible that that we can see or have this sort of conversation between this moment in taking care of refugees, in particular, of course, we've been talking about Armenian refugees, but there's obviously also other refugees within this Ottoman realm as contributing to this international conversation. So I would like to hear more about the rhetoric and the defining language of your actors that speak to the formation of the refugee as a vulnerable category. And I will leave it at there. I, I will chime in with other questions for, for uh, individual papers that I found found in, uh, interesting and that may come up, came, come up in, in conversation. So, but the figure of the refugee, I think, is an important, uh, important uh, moment. And so I'll invite Ari to come back and actually invite everyone to come back, I guess, and unmute their cameras, everyone who has been participating. And of course, also inviting audience, uh, the audience members to ask questions from any of the participants over the last two days. And it's been a pleasure uh, participating and, and seeing all your work. It's been great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Melanie. Um, I think Alp, Alp can also answer this. Who, um, what is refugee? What was refugee at that time? For example, the CUP leaders, if they, if they were accepted as like political refugees, perhaps in Germany, um, after uh, after the uh, after they fled from the uh, uh, from Istanbul, the capital. So um, regarding the Armenian refugees, um, I think that um, at that time in 1918, after the genocide, there was a chaos uh, within uh, the within the international circles also in terms of uh, this organizing this humanitarian aid. Um, well. Um, I, I, my field of expertise is not the humanitarian uh, relief activities or let's say uh, human rights, uh, but um, I started to think about the, the Armenian orphans and refugees uh, when I found this one article appeared uh, on, uh, on Armenian daily uh, in uh, Jamanak about the core for Armenians. And while I was reading that article, uh, in 1923, I was actually shocked uh, because uh, no one uh, before, um, you know, previously written works, they uh, they didn't mention anything about uh, the sufferings of uh, Armenian orphans that uh, they experienced in the island, uh, far from their homes, far from their native lands, in an island, a Greek island in Corfu. So. Um, I think uh, at that time there was this chaos within the humanitarian aid circles, like uh, because there were also more than uh, 100,000 Russian, uh, white Russian refugees in Istanbul. And uh, the authorities, they, they, they didn't know how to actually accommodate these refugees in, in, in Ottoman capital, Istanbul. And then <clears throat> uh, in 1924, they actually. Um, the, the Nansen passports, they, they issued these Nansen pass, passports to actually to accommodate and find a legal status for these refugees. But 
in terms of Armenian refugees after genocide, uh, you see that there is no legal status for these uh, people, like uh, if they were refugees or uh, stateless people, or um, so the authorities didn't know how to navigate these relief activities uh, regarding the Armenians. For example, in the, in the capital, Istanbul, the Armenian Patriarchate, uh, they organized these relief activities to the Armenian orphans, but they also didn't know how to, pro how to proceed uh, in terms of helping these people. Like the near, uh, nearest relief, for example, offered transferring these Armenian orphans to Greece just to protect themselves uh, not to be given to the Turkish authorities because the Kemalist forces, they were entering the capital Istanbul and uh, nearest relief actually decided to move these Armenian orphans to Greece. So uh, why nearest relief uh, uh, makes such decision at that time? I mean, um, who is nearest relief in terms of Armenian refugees and Armenian orphans? Who decides? to you know, relocate a people, uh, or let's say refugees or orphans to Greece. Um, obviously, perhaps the Armenian Patriarchate, maybe, I don't know. The, the official authority should have been the Armenian Patriarchate or um, they, were, they were citizens of the Ottoman Empire. So, um, so there was a huge, this problem of legal status for the Armenian refugees and uh, I am still working on it, like um, reading this humanitarian relief literature, uh, interwar humanitarianism. So, um, but as of now, I am still in the process of reading the secondary literature. Um, so, should I take a note from here or Arabat, no? No, no, I just want to give an, uh, an interesting example about the refugee, you know, uh, leaving your country, uh, being a refugee kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. They used to stamp, uh, Ottoman uh, officials used to stamp all the passports of Armenians leaving uh, the Ottoman Empire. They, they had the geri dönüşü It's no, no, no, no way back. Uh, he can't come back or she can geri dönüşü yoktur. So it's like once you leave, once you take the ship, uh, you can't already use that passport. And most of the Armenians were uh, with the hope uh, they, they had the hope to come back to Ottoman or, or uh, the new Turk or Ottoman Empire sometime, right? Just like the Russian refugees in Istanbul, the quarter million Russian refugees who were trying to go back to Russia after uh, the, uh, the, the expected defeat of the uh, Lenin's uh, armies, right? So uh, just an uh, interesting uh, example. And I just want to also add something. Uh, for, yesterday, I couldn't um, make, make it about the uh, Soviet Armenian Alp. It was your uh, uh, interest, uh, it was your question, I, I guess. So Soviet Armenian, Soviet Russia, Turkish, whatever kind of um, um, uh, relationship. There is a very interesting figure. I was trying to find him, his name, but I couldn't. I think, uh, I think Mikhailian or something like that, I can find it. Uh, there is a Soviet ambassador in Ankara for 10 years, an Armenian Soviet ambassador in Ankara. So Soviet Bolshevik regime sends him to Ankara because He's from Caucasus. He speaks like Turkish, Azeri, Georgian, Armenian, uh, Russian, uh, like all the people from Caucasus, like five languages. So he was the Soviet ambassador uh, to Ankara for 10 years. And he wrote his uh, memoirs, uh, I guess. I had a file in my laptop, but I couldn't find it. Uh, my laptop crashed after, uh, after uh, nine months of teaching. Uh, so uh, I couldn't find it, but I will look it up for you. But there is a figure like that. I, yeah. I remember the Berlin. That was also the reason, and but uh, whether the Soviets would utilize the Armenians uh, in, in in Turkey. But but that's a question whether these are uh, Eastern Armenians or Western Armenians. Of course, that's uh, the question was whether there were refugee Western Armenians settled in uh, Soviet Union and then ending up in diplomatic service, but or in, in intelligence service in Turkey. But that's a adventure story. Um, that memoir was published, and there was also, I mean, yeah, this is the this is a question from yesterday, but there was this um, Transcaucasian uh, Republic trade delegation as well in Istanbul that was set up in 1922. So there was some, I don't know the composition of the delegation, but they, they were representing the Armenian Socialist Republic or the Transcaucasian Socialist Republic in Istanbul in the final year of the occupation. Uh, I don't know much. The, the, the example, the figure I, I'm saying it's from 30s. Uh, he, he served as the ambassador in 30s in Ankara as the Soviet ambassador. So, Soviet uh, uh, 
Uh, okay. okay, maybe it's a different one then. There was a memoir published by one Soviet ambassador in the 20s in Ankara. That's yeah. Yeah, we have to ask Onurishchi, so I think he would help us. Um, should I answer, uh, should I reply to, uh, to, uh, to Melanie's comments? Um, uh, so it's, uh, so it's, it's, of course, I'm, I'm in, a, in a kind of in an awkward situation here in, with, with kind of having, uh, having, having as refugees the, the, the young Turk leaders, the leaders of the CUP. Uh, and Melanie asked about their, their kind of their defining rhetoric about, about being a refugee and about internationalism. Uh, and, it's, uh, uh, and I think the main issue that they are, uh, they uh, witnessed and they were very aware of this was the extra legality. So this was, so this was a, a kind of a clandestine exile. So this was very different as I wrote in the paper, very different from what Wilhelm II had in going to Netherlands or, uh, uh, or other monarchs who had to leave their country and go to somewhere else. And, this, and in all those cases, it was official. It was also a, a di dynastic monarch who were all cousins with each other and so forth. But uh, there was something else in the case of the CUP. So there was, uh, there was an extradition treaty between, uh, between uh, Germany and Ottoman Empire signed in January 1917. I think somehow the CUP leaders had kind of a foreshadowing and uh, they excluded political uh, extradition rights out of this. So the, the, the only possibility for the uh, regime was uh, corruption uh, allegations. Nevertheless, Talat never was registered as uh, as, uh, as Talat Pasha. In uh, so he had he was using the name Ali Sai, mm -hmm. uh, and and Jamal was under the name Babovic, a Bosnian Muslim, uh, and and he had they all had their fake names. So so, so this was kind of the this uh, this kind of the semi -ill illegal nature of their of their uh, of their uh, refuge. And this is, I think, important. I think that the conventional uh, approach to them has been, especially from the perspective of the Armenian uh, genocide studies, to, to simply criminalize them and then leave it at that. Uh, but this doesn't help us understand the international relations and the inter international system of that period. I think we have to look into this, this ambiguity uh, which is underlying there. This is because it explains us a lot how, uh, how the new world order was being formed. Uh, and, and as such, they were, uh, it's, there is a duality there. So they're on the one hand, they're like old Komitaji having these uh, fake names uh, and so forth. And, and, and, and in their letters, they're also kind of uh, using allegories and metaphors and do not sometimes openly talk about certain things like, like old Fedais and, and Komitages. But on the other hand, they're also so elder statesmen. So they have this habitus of being a stateless statesman, especially Talat, uh, so so that they come with this habitus of, of uh, uh, so uh, I have uh, I have ruled over this empire, I have all these networks, I have this reputation and so forth. So they are both revolutionaries and and statesmen, and this is a duality of their of their of their uh, of their reputation, which also helps them in different cases. So uh, to the socialists, they are, they try to come up as the the revolutionaries. Uh, to the Germans, however, they're always the statesmen. So. Um, and I think here, uh, and I think this connects also to what uh, what uh, what Ryan yesterday talked about. This that this is that these that, that there are these this this tyranny of received narratives, and one narrative is about the the betrayal, the other one is about the triumph. Uh, and like Ryan also said, during during this period of the armistice, uh, it was a dynamic process, dynamic formation. So one actor who started being triumphant could end up being betrayed and, and one starting in betrayal could end up in triumph. So, and in this trajectory, I think the trajectory of the young Turk leaders who went into, uh, into exile is also, I think, uh, particular uh, because uh, they, their story is, do, not, do not necessarily fit into the triumphant narrative of Mustafa Kemal. So this is, I think, very important to remember. So if, if they would have survived, uh, uh, survived, they would have certainly not been able to come back to Turkey. They would have still been in one kind of another conflict with the, with the Kemalist regime. So this is, I think, an important uh, change. While they had identified with those refugees who were sent to Malta, these were their friends, uh, uh, but they, they could have easily have been one of 
uh, the 150 uh, persona non grata, which the Ankara government had selected. And in Anwar's case, he was married to the dynasty. So he was already excluded being, uh, so, and his family was, and his children was excluded for a long time. Uh, so I think this is also an interesting uh, dynamic here. And regards to internationalism, just briefly, I think uh, we are now, let's say the study of Armenian genocide, how this contributed to internationalism. I think this is very important. And I think we are going now, we are witnessing now a major change because the major paradigm of studying the Armenian genocide has been nationalism through the 1990s and 2000s. And it was very productive and it was, it, it revealed this, this nation state formation and demographic violence. But now, but it also kind of came with its own methodological nationalism. And it also reflected uh, certain aspects. Now we are having this, this empire perspective Mm -hmm. in, in the study of Armenian uh, genocide. And that is very relevant, especially for the armistice uh, period. And here, there is a problem here, of course, we have this cosmopolitanism, which Arda uh, has underlined. And this was also part of this empire. And we can only understand this through the empire. Humanitarianism, we can only understand it through, uh, through uh, empire. But then we have also anti-colonialism in this period, we can, which we can only understand through, uh, through the empire framework. And here, here uh, Talat uh, and Enver and Jamal, they all subscribed to this anti-colonial narrative. And they had done this already even before. So Teshkilat Mahsusa with this duality. Uh, so which story we pick? Do we pick the Anatolian story or do we pick the pan-Islamic story? This, this duality, these two dimensions were already there. Uh, and and this, uh, my explanation to this relies on a theory by uh, Fred Halliday, the late Fred Halliday. In his explanation of internationalism, he says there is a dual uh, process, and this is also a, a contradictory process. While internationalism uh, enforces relations among societies, among non-state actors, uh, on the one side, on the other side, it also enforces the competition of nation states and the domination of nation states. And that is the bitter irony of internationalism, that at the end, that actually nation states are on top. So, and here, Turkey is triumphant and, and, and, and Soviet Russia, and there is no more space for, for, for a, a Armenia and, and such. So the losers of these, uh, these, uh, this dynamic, and once Afghanistan is there, there are no more the Central Asian Hanats and so forth because it has a direct border with Soviet Union. So I think this dynamic is very interesting in which I do think that the young Turks uh, played a role. Yeah, the, uh, for example, Jamal Pasha went to Afghanistan, right, to, to start this anti-colonial war against the imperialist powers, and then Emir Pasha went to Central Asia. Somewhere. But I think here, Jamal's example is very, very indicative. Jamal insisted on a Russian-Afghan treaty. And he insisted on that the only way for Afghanistan is to uh, through a friendship treaty with Afghanistan. And and he and, and it, it and, and and and I think it's February 1921. Afghanistan signed a treaty with uh, with Soviet. Uh, but one result out of this was uh, uh, Jamal was unnecessary. So and he became obsolete. And he became also obsolete after the Turkish Afghan treaty. So, uh, so they, there were no more space for them uh, once the nation states uh, were the norm again in, in international yeah, system. One, one may argue that these CUP leaders before war, during the war, they had this also imperialist, um, let's yes, say. Yes, I mean, we had, I think, uh, I don't know who, I think it's, was, I think uh, either yeah. in Ryan's or uh, Sunni, uh, Professor Sunni, is that there is, there is young Turk imperialism. I mean, this is, we have not only nationalism, but imperialism on behalf of the young Turks. Yeah, let's continue with Daniel. You, you write. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to just respond to um, to Melanie's points. I mean, and I think that uh, it's yeah, these concepts uh, like the idea of this kind of emergent human rights regime that emerges around a refugee internationalism. There is a kind of a bunch of contradictions in there, obviously, um, and um, this is something I'm taking, I guess. Uh, to this context, a point that my, Michael Provence makes about uh, the mandates in, in the Middle East, which you're probably familiar with that work. Uh, the, the kind of what's funny is that whilst the state of Istanbul, like what's going on and the state of the refugees in Anatolia inspires all of this kind of language, what's happening on the ground is completely contrary to any kind of idea of, I mean, human rights. I mean, in Istanbul after March 1920, there's, there's no right to kind of congregate. There's no 
um, freedom of speech, there's multiple systems of censorship, there's new like on martial law and other legal regimes that, you know, allow for like imprisonment and fine without trial by allied troops, there's like the reestablishment of the capitulations, which kind of gives completely different legal rights according to one's um, nationality. Um, and, and so what's, yeah, what's uh, kind of ironic is whilst the kind of powers are talking about establishing this kind of new system, uh, it's completely, I mean, it's not very, the, the kind of the unit of that system is not really the human. It's still about, there's still an idea that there will be a kind of a privileged role for the great powers in, in the kind of Treaty of Sevres system for managing Istanbul and the Straits Zone, for example, where they'll, they'll get disproportionate number of votes. And, and all of the kind of urban governance is carried out by these, you know, allied Ottoman committees where, where there's always a kind of a, a deliberate kind of a proportioning of power to, to the allies. So this is something I think has to be borne in mind when kind of thinking about these abstract debates what's actually going on on the ground is, is a come going in the other direction. And I think that's why your work is so, so very important, right? Because you, you do use the, the sources of the League of Nations as, as you're sort of, uh, as, as I think much of, towards the end of your paper, you use much of them to sort of explore these cases of sex workers. And it's interesting, you use it in terms of kind of painting a picture as to what what what it looks like on the ground and um and it it it would be interesting to to sort of speak back to the source and in, in, in a way for me to think of what can the source itself and the framing and the discourse and the rhetoric of the source tell us about this new international institution and how does that actually highlights what you just said right the sort of the discrepancy between something that is is supposed to think of of you know a common humanity uh, but then it's also seriously paternalistic. It seems like that all of the cases that you mentioned towards the end that are, um, are uh, that are about women and violence, it seems that there's there must always be a man involved, that there's always a client that is also being injured in that in that encounter. And, and maybe I'm, you know, I obviously just read a little piece of your paper, but it seemed to me that there was, that there was sort of uh, something that the source could tell us actually about the institution, perhaps more than it could tell us about what's actually happening on the ground. <clears throat> yeah, now I will turn to Erda. Well, so so um, just to, to, to add uh, uh, another thread or two, uh, you know, th this, this figure of the refugee, I think is, is really significant and there's, um, uh, you know, we know there's a late Ottoman. I mean, we, we can take this back to um, the 1850s, if I'm not mistaken, but the the, the Mouadjir Commission, there, there's a commission within, um, there's consciousness of the, st the, the, the status of a, of a figure of the refugee much earlier, actually, um, and, and, and a kind of resettlement program that's going on that's clearly affecting the politics as well, so that that was one thing I wanted to sort of extend it back. Actually, we could we can go further in time, which is interesting. The other thing is, I was I was reading um, uh, you know this memoir by Simon uh, Arakelian, um, it was recently translated from uh, Armino Turkish into Turkish, um, called Ankara Wakat Wukat uh, about this uh, you know story of deportation of a of a Catholic Armenian. What was interesting to me reading that was was thinking about these issues of ethics. And the refugee was was how class enters in because it, it was clear based on on that and other and it would be interesting to, to hear what other people say that um, <clears throat> that that certain people if they had money um, were somehow able to to alleviate some of the um, the suffering of the uh, the tetir and the deportations and were also witness to um, a kind of rural population that was being decimated and and and and paying witness to that but. The issue here of a humanitarian ethics is, is interesting. And so I think we need to, to introduce this idea, you know, rural population versus uh, urban population, as well as class. And then, uh, you know, the last thing perhaps is this idea. So along with the figure of the refugee, we do have a kind of more elite diaspora population. And this is, you know, some of our artistic figures who are, who are also moving, you know, they're going all, you know, all around the region, they're being moved, they're being forced to leave, uh, they can't return. Um, 
but but they are also creating another level of perhaps a kind of uh, network or international international consciousness, uh, which I think is interesting. So I, I don't know how all these things come together, but I, but I do think that there's there's a lot there, a lot more that we need to work through and think about um, in this regard. <clears throat> uh, so now I want to, yeah, I want to turn Aisha Noor. Um, All right, uh, you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I just also wanted to reflect on um, uh, Melanie's question on uh, these refugee uh, re regimes and refugee generating processes around the time of the armistice. Um, under the Tsarist government uh, for Armenian refugees, particularly, we see sort of regulations uh, like refugee tickets to use for registration of Armenians uh, that are basically passing uh, the battle zones and ending up in the South Caucasus. And there, one interesting thing, uh, and this is what uh, Asya Darvinian worked on, um, that the refugees often find themselves in a situation where they have to prove that they are Armenian refugees and that they are Christian and that they have to cross themselves or recite certain Christian prayers to Russian forces. So we see this, this you know, the, the whole concept uh, coming with, you know, uh, the type of, you know, convincing um, the, the authorities. Um, and then as time passes and, and the, you know, the, the, Tsarist regime collapses, and then you see a whole bunch of um, international refugee organizations still working in, uh, you know, in alignment with the, the the First Republic, and then afterwards the Transcaucasus Republic, um, and with the establishment of the Soviet Union, we see this whole politicization. Of, of refugee agencies in the Soviet Union and also outside. Um, and so we basically see this, this world of the refugees torn into different camps, not only, um, you know, Muslim, Christian, or, you know, different ethnicities, but also um, aligning themselves with the Bolsheviks or the capitalist Americans. Uh, we see the Soviet government around the 20s uh, trying to come up with alternative institutions and um, basically making the all international uh, American or British agencies disappear from the Soviet Union. Um, and so it's basically um, one of those examples where we see this politicization. By 25, we see uh, that uh, there's one institution, Hayastani Okunutun Committee. Um, it is uh, it's an agency that extensively worked with Armenian diaspora communities, um, but uh, excluded anything and everything that had to do with Christianity, church properties, uh, and uh, the the international agencies like Near East Relief. And then the third point I wanted to reflect on is the um, establishment of a new Bolshevik regime as a refugee ge generating process itself. Um, so with the establishment of different SSRs, we see that population, uh, different populations, different religious ethnic populations are moved around. So that is also something to think about. We see certain Azeris and Kurds already being uh, settled in uh, parts of the Azerbaijani SSR as uh, a result of the, the the establishment of the SSR. So it's not only the First World War, but also, or maybe it's not only the, the nation state itself that generates this uh, problem of refugee, but also uh, a multinational Soviet empire uh, could also do that. 
Yeah, I want to add one final thing about the refugee status, and then I will move to Professor Suni's question. Um, so uh, after 1923, many Armenian refugees, like in in the in diaspora in the United States, when they when they wanted to go back to Turkey, for example, uh, they were refused to uh, enter the country. Um, they because they were they were already United States citizens, but the Turkish Republic, the Turkish authorities told them that no, you you you are Turkish citizens, but uh, we cannot allow you to enter the, this to this country. So many Armenian refugees, like from United States, they were forced to go back to United States, and they were not allowed to enter the Republic of Turkey, not to you know uh, claim their properties uh, and uh, etc. So uh, we know this from the book of Taner Akşam and um, and Ümit Kurt's book. Um, so um, I want to uh, move uh, to Professor Suni's question to the uh, panelists. Uh, for the second session. So, um, Professor uh, Suni asks, uh, these writers and artists are dealing not only with war and atrocities, but also with new visions and hopes for the future. Could any of the panelists talk about connections of these writers or artists with the increasing emergence of socialist alternatives to the war and capitalism, which were seen as sources of catastrophe uh, during the First World War. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, there is something uh, came to my mind interesting. I would like to briefly add or respond to, to this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a very uh, big uh, question. But uh, for example, for Armenians right after the genocide, Armenian writers, I mean, uh, now I don't work on this, uh, but I, I have done an extensive research uh, before before starting my doctorate. So Armenian writers in, in uh, or poets and writers right after the uh, genocide. So there is this politicization, politicization of the writers and poets, like because 250 of the uh, members of the intelligentsia has been killed, there are like a few writers. So everyone takes political responsibility, talks about politics, you know, uh, attends, uh, becomes member of the inter international delegations, whatever. So they were very much into that. But for example, what, it, what was interesting, uh, there, there isn't a clear cut uh, ideological project. Like we, we will build a socialist uh, Armenia, a greater Armenia, or we will build, build a nation state Armenia or whatever. And for example, uh, about this, um, this, this, this also speaks about the maps, right? So usually in uh, Armenian national thinking, you know, they, uh, like uh, Tashnaks love to do it usually, right? I mean, they have this map of Great Armenia stretching from Cilicia to, uh, to Kars and, you know, also covering Kurdistan and whatever. And it was pretty much the map uh, presented in Paris Peace Conference in 1919. But one, uh, for example, thing that Armenian nationalist uh, movement and readings, uh, their readings miss Armenians in the Paris co conference, like most of them were poets and writers and they wrote about it later. They are not saying that this land from Cilicia to Armenia covering the Kurd, uh, today's uh, Kurdish, uh, um, uh, Kurdish cities, uh, it's not the uh, Armenian, greater Armenia because it is Armenian. It belongs to Armenia. They say we are the only uh, power here who can build a peaceful country for Armenians, for ourselves, but we can also accommodate Kurds. Circassians, we can accommodate Assyrians. We are the only democratic movement. We are Christians, we, we have a better uh, education level, we, we know foreign languages, whatever. We have, uh, we have been trading with, with the West, we, we, we have a, more, uh, a better understanding of the democracy. So we are the people who can build, but there is no socialism or whatever. It is not a clear cut project. It's a uh, vision of an, another empire, another Armenian empire, which will accommodate every kind of uh, ethnic uh, ethnic members and then give uh, their rights and then uh, keep the equality and so on. This was just uh, what I wanted to add. Thank you. Uh, could I add something there, Ari? Sure. Sure. So a couple of things. Um, no, the, the, in the wonderful paper on, on the artists, there was, uh, to my great pleasure, a drawing of Karl Marx and there was some uh, journal or something about socialism and sanat and art. I thought that was really interesting. So I'd like to hear about that. A couple of small points. Um, Ararat, uh, Kurugavaya Paruka. Kurugavaya Paruka 
has a very specific meaning in Russia, as you know. And it is about the collective responsibility of the village. And it's a negative thing. Uh, it sounds socialist maybe, but it's a negative thing once you get to the Soviet period. And so Mandelstam's use of that is extraordinary. I was so shocked by it because you wouldn't have heard that before. Shahinyan. Marietta Shahinyan is using it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But that seemed to me really interesting that that would be used, carried over in that way. The guy you're thinking about as the ambassador, not ambassador really, because it wasn't an ambassador, but diplomatic representative, you know, plenipotentiary, was Lev Karah Karahan. And Lev Karahan served uh, in Ankara from 1934 to 1937, and then went back to Russia, to the Soviet Union, and was murdered by Stalin. So much for socialism. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, so um, now from, from... May I say something to, to, uh, yeah. uh, to Ron's sure, question sure. I, for, for socialism capital? I think we have to be also very careful that there is also a third way which really emerges in the armistice period. And this is this kind of revanchism. And this revanchism is very, very important. I, uh, so David Motadel wrote an excellent paper in the uh, American Historical Review of last year about this, this, uh, this global, mo uh, global authoritarian moment. We see that that this this all, all those who were not satisfied with the end of the World War One actually uniting and, and Nazis were very very dominant about this, and and the story of uh, of these Turkestani legions and the Armenian legions of the Nazi uh, uh, of the Wehrmacht and the SS it demonstrates actually that there is a third way which was imagined kind of as uh, as out of those who were not happy with uh, with the solution hmm. of the First World War. Uh, I can also remark on uh, Professor Sunni's uh, question as well. I mean, um, now Mickey Smile, he became one of the Spartacus, but he was also criticized by uh, other thinkers uh, and he was referred as a champagne socialist. Uh, he was, uh, I mean, first of all, he was uh, born into a very privileged uh, family in Istanbul. He's Muslim, but an Ottoman bourgeois. He, he was Francophile. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, we have the photographs of his house. It looks like, you know, like he's, he had a very privileged, uh, um, you know, household uh, designed with Orientalist um, in, in oriental style and in fact in the republic i think uh hashim told him that he was like the state because he had the navy and the army because he had a yacht and then in a in a, and an amazing car so i mean i don't want to reduce reduce him of course to to you know to to, to his privileged life uh but i would ag agree with uh, ararat that these these were not very clear cuts i mean it was a kind of a fluid movement in a way he saw as a young man, uh, you know, a, a light in, in, in socialism when he was in uh, Berlin. And he, he remained active in the, in, in the uh, left movement for another five days, five uh, years. Uh, and, you know, as I say, he became a part of the establishment and director of the fine arts school. And as far as we know, he was not that active anymore after 1925. Uh, but I think that this is why I find very interesting is that the armistice period, and especially uh, the time between November 1918 to May 1919, uh, was a time when you could hear really alternative voices in, among the Ottoman intelligentsia. Um, and it's the time where you know, if, um, people were discussing, they were criticizing the war, they were criticizing the CUP um, and so on and so forth, yeah. Uh, do, do, we know, uh, do we know of an encounter between Namak Ismail and uh, Talat Pasha in Berlin? Uh, we don't know. I mean, uh, Nami Kismail, unlike Tarlemezian, never wrote his memoirs. And when he passed away, he was, he, he was quite young. But what we know, how we know his history, his stories during that time uh, are the interviews he gave in the Republican period. Uh, it's a possibility that there is a silence. Yeah, it's always the case. It might be the case because, I mean, you know, 
the transition to the Republic and one of the things that strike me most uh, is the silence over that, uh, over the history of the First World War and the Armistice period where when, when these artists and intellectuals don't really want to talk about those years. Uh, you know, okay, Tyler Mezian remembers, you know, he writes about Namik Ismail, he writes about uh, Ibrahim Chali in his memoirs, but we don't hear Namik Ismail talking about his relationship with Talat, he doesn't talk about his relationship with Enver, but we know that Namik was one of the artists who was commissioned by the war ministry in 1917 directly to produce war-related works, even though the outcome was not pro-war, but he was commissioned by the war ministry. So hence Enver Pasha. I mean, whether he had a you know personal relationship with him, we don't know. But uh, these questions are interesting. I mean, silences are also interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Because the Turkish socialist in Berlin in 1919 at that time strongly criticized Talat Pasha and mm -hmm. protested Talat Pasha yeah. when he when he wanted to meet with these Turkish uh, yeah. young people. Uh, Erda, do you want to add your comment? Uh, just a quick uh, another connection. There is um, interesting to think about the the central place of the village and the villager that occupies um, uh, literature and cultural production starting really, you know, essentially in the 30s, as well as socialist realism, uh, both um, in a kind of visual idiom, as well as a, a literary idiom, and, and accommodate some dissent. But, I mean, the problem, obviously, is, you know, to, to what degree is it corrupted by state power? But um, really, it's something that, that lasts um, and sort of ties, in some ways, a, a vision in, in Soviet space with uh, with um, the Republic of Turkey in, into the 70s, you know, really up until the 1980 military coup. Just another comment. Thank you. So um, I want to ask a question again, you, uh, Erda, actually. Uh, perhaps also Ararat and uh, perhaps also William uh, regarding the literature in Greece. So, um, this question about forgetting the Ottoman cosmopolitan past, particularly after 1923 in the Turkish literature. Um, for example, uh, Yahya Kemal, uh, one of the famous conservative uh, and nationalist uh, authors of the Turkish literature, in one of his articles claims that there are three hills, tepe, in Turkish literature. One uh, was the Çamlıca, Çamlıca hill, representing Tanzimat literature, the other one uh, was Tepebaşı uh, Hill, representing the Serveti Finun and Pera literature. And the final one was Metristepe Hill. Um, Metristepe was a, a small village in Eskişehir close to Ankara, and it represented the Turkish nationalist literature. So um, I think uh, the Turkish nationalist authors and the state uh, officially implemented this agenda uh, to forget the cosmopolitan Ottoman past. Uh, I think in Turkey, uh, the state uses this uh, nationalism uh, and in the Soviet regime, they wanted to forget their, um, the past, the, the Russian, the past of the, you know, the Russian empire. So um, could you elaborate on this, uh, on the reasons and roots of um, the forgetting this uh, cosmopolitan uh, Ottoman past? Um, so, so yeah, that, that's a um, really really famous um, piece. Uh, it, it, a, a couple things to think about there is um, again all these these intellectuals who were charged with kind of adopting or articulating end up articulating a kind of nationalist perspective are are, are all incredibly you know come come from incredibly sort of cosmopolitan mixed backgrounds, uh, uh, Yahya Kemal is in, is in France, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're, they're multi-language, and that, and that gets suppressed a little bit, and he articulates this interesting idea uh, relative to this, it, which is this concept of Turk Istanbul, uh, right, which is then adopted by Tampanar uh, and others, and I would say you could probably trace it all the way through uh, Orhan Pamuk in some respects, but this idea that the city, um, the, the essence of the city, it, it, what, what has been Turkish um, historically and is, is something that we need to de develop that, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's a contradiction in terms in a way, it, it, it doesn't go very 
far, but there, there is an attempt somehow to appropriate um, that, that, spa that space. Um, you know, and, and I think it's, um, you know, the, the other thing that obviously Yahya Kemal uh, is really interested in is this idea of the conquest, you know, the idea of the conquest of Istanbul by uh, Mehmet II as being some, you know, you know f fundamental uh, origin for this notion of Turkish Istanbul, which is, it's quite the opposite as, as we know, uh, re reading the history. So it's, it's a, it's a revisionist history that, um, that literature then is, used to articulate and, and popularize in a way that is extremely problematic, uh, uh, obviously, for, for, for many reasons. Um, th I mean, those are the things that, that come to mind. The other thing, I mean, I, you know, all of these, even, you know, coming back to this issue of the possibility of a, of a socialist imaginary or classless society, et cetera, but, but you know, Nazim Hikmet is held up as a kind of icon of, of uh, Turkish uh, world literature, but you know, people don't. You know, no one talks about the fact that he's uh, you know, educated in, in Moscow, that he speaks fluent Russian. You know, he's also there. There are figures. How can I say it? Of almost of a uh, maybe saying world literature is too much, but but they are truncated in the way they are uh, reintroduced, reappropriated by the state, and then articulated through the the media You know, through, through through the through the coursework, and their their work is also a little bit selective. But but that idea of Turkish Istanbul is something I think that we could tied directly to her as a response to the occupation of the city as being a, a sort of some kind of trauma that needs to be rewritten. Yeah, yeah, they particularly claim that, um, for example, Fatih neighborhood in Istanbul, very conservative neighborhood, and they say that Fatih is the real Istanbul, yeah. but Pera and Beolo is the, you know, fake Istanbul, you know, full of non-Muslim communities, et cetera. Uh, I could, could I jump in as well? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, one really important thing to, to take into consideration is that uh, literary histories are curated and they're curated for us by excluding lots of other things that are also there and uh, rolling around in the weeds. Um, and so I think when we talk about uh, the, this kind of Turkish nationalist philology, it, it sucks up all, all the oxygen in the room when we're looking at uh, mainstream print and media, but there are all these other uh, literatures that are also uh, thriving, or maybe not thriving, but they're also existing at the same time. Um, Erdogan mentioned, you know, the kind of socialist. So, um, while, while we kind of tend to gravitate towards Halidedi for this kind of proto feminism, we also have people like uh, Swat Dervish, uh, who's a kind of embraces a, a socialist feminism. Uh, her, her novel, Buramano Lonche Lirin Romanadur is a, a really groundbreaking, I think, uh, um, look at Istanbul and the kind of underclass that it's producing in the early Republican period. Um, and then you also have uh, things that I'm looking at, like a lot of refugee literatures that continue to produce Turkish language literatures uh, throughout the, the uh, Kemalist and Republican periods, but because they're written in different scripts, they're, they're written by re refugees, they're circulated in non-mainstream uh, media, they're just kind of uh, they fall under the radar, but these things are there, and they maintain and they um, reproduce uh, what what we what we've been calling uh, cosmopolitan uh, uh, Ottoman cultural production. Um, and then in, in where they wind up as well, like in, in Greek philology, for example, you asked me to talk a little about uh, this Ari. Um, Greek philology is is equally invested in kind of curating and partitioning and segregating. Um, these these voices and these traditions out of out of their their canon, so they they totally fall off the radar as well in Greek philology. And I think one of the one of the big projects of uh, philology of reparations that we we owe this period is to start to um, not just critique and take apart um, the nationalist philology and its narratives, but also to think about what we can give back and re and recovering some of these um, these traditions and, and publishing them again and, and sharing them. Um, I have a question to um, Aisha Nur uh, about the concept of um, the concept of Yergir. Actually, uh, I was wondering during your fieldwork uh, in Armenia, uh, when you were talking uh, with the Armenian families, 
Uh, did they refer Yergir uh, as their local homeland, less like um, Sasun, Bitlis, Mush, or they refer Yergir as a like a national homeland in Eastern Anatolia or let's say historic Armenia? Thanks, sorry. This is a great question. I'm also thinking about it a lot. Um, I believe the term Ergir as a national homeland has been replaced by the much more politicized term Western Armenia. And this is predominantly because of the usage in the diaspora, it's very prevalent, uh, and also the latest politicization uh, of the post-Soviet period of the Armenian um, spheres, right? Um, so we see the emergence of the term Western Armenia um, as a sort of reaction to the Stalinist regime in the 60s and the 70s, but then it really takes off. And um, beside the literary, you know, representations like memoirs and novels, we don't really see Ergir as a political, you know, as a source of political discussion in Armenia. And that, up to this day remains like that. So when I talk to people on the, you know, the sites, the field works, often they ask, like, for instance, uh, like, Ergir inch pese, like, how is Ergir? They mean that the, you know, the type of ancestral homeland they come from, or like they originate from, not the whole imaginary ethnic homeland. Um, so it very much connotes this local uh, identity, I think. Yeah, I think it still also lives within the Armenian communities around the world, uh, this local idea of uh, Yergir homeland, because, you know, Sepastasi Armenians love Sepastasis and Sasuncis love Sasuncis. So we still have this uh, local um, concept of uh, Yergir, uh, Memleket, for example. Yeah. But I have to add one thing. There is towards the end of the uh, uh, the centenary, um, a lot of discussions about people's ancestral homelands have also been politicized in Armenia. There is a really interesting documentary series in Armenia. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Bare Vergir. It's this guy, Samvel Topalian, um, traverses uh, anything and everything, anywhere in Eastern Turkey that Armenian heritage has been left. And he conceptualizes this whole thing around the idea of Ergir. So there's also this popularization of Ergir as a political uh, space. And that's very recent, I have to say. Uh, Ryan? Hey, I am so sorry to have bounced in and out of this uh, session this morning. Um, every morning in my house is always crazy and today was especially crazy because I had to go get my COVID shot so uh, I just that's why I dropped out so I've, I've missed a lot of this discussion and I really apologize uh, I just first of all I want to say again thank you so much for having me it's really uh, I don't come to many history workshops or conferences anymore and I really enjoyed this one um, and not only that I found it really helpful uh, I, I want to I'm not sure if you necessarily if if you've covered this ground already, and if you have, just let me know and uh, you can just move on. What struck me between today and yesterday was, you know, the emphasis on testimony and the development of new sources of personal testimony regarding this period of time. And it draws a really striking comparison to the bulk of, let's just say, kind of more Kamalist, Turkish friendly sources that one finds from this period. I mean, there, as I'm sure all of you know, there are umpteen different memoirs or diaries that now one can find um, a, any good bookstore, any Turk good Turkish language bookstore. Um, but one finds it's not necessarily a very diverse set of, of, of oral sources. And it certainly is nowhere near as diverse as what was presented here to, you know, in the workshop or even sort of beyond it. I, I mean, one thing that I'm more familiar with and uh, I believe I'm sure Aishinur is as well is the sort of the, for example, the USC 
uh, video archive of, of genocide survivors and so on. And, and for my book, you know, now I've, I've, and for past books, I've found these really, really helpful. I was wondering if, you know, any of you could reflect on the, uh, A, the availability of oral accounts from, let's just say, from Muslim perspectives, particularly those who are not officers and generals or sort of, or officials. And more importantly, sort of the, you know, the reason why there is such a seeming dearth, right? Why there is no repository on the sort of scale of something like, you know, the Anatolian, I, I forget the act, what, what the full name is, but the the Greek um, archive, I, th I think it's in either in Athens or Salonika of of Greeks who had you know who had um, been exchanged after twenty three, or something akin to the Hagopian collection or the Zorian collection. I, I remember many many many years ago in my first and only meeting with Stanford Shaw. You know he, uh, I hate to speak ill of the dead, but he basically I had asked him this sort of similar question, and he said to me point blank. Well, Muslims, you know, Turks don't complain like Armenians. So, you know, we don't have, you know, you can't find this sort of thing. Although he had suggested perhaps at the Red Crescent Society, there could be something similar to kind of oral accounts. So anyway, I'm going to shut up and, and listen to your responses. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know that USC Archives and Zorian Institute in Toronto, uh, they have such collection, but um, regarding the Ottoman Muslims and Turks about their oral accounts. I, I, I don't know. If, um, I mean, if, if someone else know, uh, let us know. Um, yeah. Um, actually, we have a question from uh, the audience uh, asked by um, Viken Cholakian. Um, so Viken asks, um, there were photographers, uh, yeah, this question I think to uh, Gizem, uh, there were photographers during that period. Uh, would the, uh, would the uh, photography of that period be categorized as art or artistic? Could you mention some if there are? Uh, I mean, there were photographers uh, and for, um, I mean, the most famous photographer family is the Dildilian family, uh, and they photographed, uh, you know, uh, they were Armenian family and they photographed uh, various parts in uh, Anatolia and uh, Marzifon Siva Samson. Um, I also note, uh, because I saw that question, um, and, you know, um, for general photographers in the Ottoman Empire, I can suggest the book Kamera Ottomana, edited by Zeynep Çelik and Etem Aldam recently, but it comes until 1914, uh, from 1840 to 1914. And for, again, uh, if uh, the, you know, for those of you who are interested in the politics of uh, photography and Armenian genocide, I would also suggest uh, David Law, my friend and colleague who worked on uh, on photography. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it is art or not is, of course, uh, open to discussion. Uh, I mean, you know, it's in itself, I think, um, I mean, it depends whether these photographs uh, are exhibited or whether there's, they are used as archival documents. Uh, it's an interesting question, definitely, but you know, um, not very easy to answer, I believe. Thank you for the question. Uh, well, um, I want to turn uh, actually to da Daniel. Um, I have a question about this um, in official Turkish narrative, uh, it is argued that the increase in sex work, uh, prostitution, like alcohol consumption in Turkey, etc., um, were because of the Allied occupation. Uh, so, was it because of the Allied occupation, or um, was it a natural consequence of war, poverty, and um, the economic crisis? Um. Well, it depends. I mean, 
Definitely. Like I, I've written about alcohol also. Um, and, and, you know, in both cases, you obviously have like many thousands of allied soldiers who are buying alcohol and buying sex. And that increases uh, the supply of those, uh, of those services as well. Um, but, um, uh, you know, of course, this is, they still, you know, they, they have an existing uh, a broader clientele, civilian clientele also that are, you know, are consuming those things. And uh, the the kind of, I mean, a tribute, there's a kind of, it's funny actually in the, in the you know, Yeshulai organization, who is this anti-addiction organization, they had until recently, they had this completely um, made up story on how their institution was established in 1920, because the allies had come and were giving out free alcohol to the Muslim population to try and uh, weaken their resilience to occupation, which is like a complete, you know, there's no, I have never found any evidence of that. They were definitely interested in selling alcohol, like the French uh, mm. spirit manufacturers were often writing to the high commissioners and, um, you know, and kind of arguing and for kind of commercial advantages. Um, but uh, I don't think it had much impact on the long-term trajectory normally mainly because it's there's this period of prohibition that follows the the end of the occupation anyway that kind of really eradicates a lot of the kind of the places of um the brasseries and bars that get set up in the occupation period don't survive into the republic just a few a few of them and uh you know what really i think what really affects what leads to this decline in in sex work is not just the evacuation of the allied forces but it's just the general economic collapse of istanbul in the early republican period and the huge decline in population that you see um in that time as well uh, and the, and some kind of more stringent measures adopted in the early turkish republic so it, the kind of the the material kind of demand and supply factors are probably more important than the kind of cultural attitudes towards alcohol and prostitution that are represented by the west because those military officers are obviously uh, often, um, they share what's often I think hidden by a kind of conservative nationalist discourse in Turkey is how much the opinion of cosmopolitan Istanbul was shared between allied officers and Turkish nationalists in that they both thought of the kind of cosmopolitan seedy districts of Istanbul as equally, you know, corrupt and, um, and, and even some allied officers sympathized with, you know, Turkish aspirations to kind of homogenize the city mm -hmm. because of that, those kind of attitudes. Mm -hmm. And uh, on this kind of, just if I can use the chance to, to answer to Ryan's comment. Um, okay, I mean, I don't know about recordings, but one of the really interesting ways you can get access to kind of local, um, opinion like of kind of unimportant people is the postal and telegraph censorship that the allies impose in Istanbul where you see they basically would summarize and translate uh, letters and telegraphs that were being sent from Istanbul to the provinces in order to try and gain an idea of what the public mood was about though they're obviously curated because they just kind of choose the letters that they find interesting or important but it's still a nice way of getting access to kind of uh, yeah, the um, alternative voices. Thank you so much, Daniel. That that's a great um, recommendation. Where where would you find this? Uh, it's in the um, FO three seven one, or is it FO three seventy? This like yeah, all of the Istanbul occupation files are, but unfortunately not cataloged at all. Huh. Okay. Thanks so much. I'll I'll follow up with you on that. Well, uh, this has been a very uh, thought-provoking yeah, conversation and discussion. Uh, I think our time is over now. Uh, yeah, Arad, go ahead, one, one final thing. Are you, are you uh, wrapping up? It's the final? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this was a mostly a uh, workshop on Armenians, but we didn't hear any Armenian. Uh, I want to uh, read a poem. Uh, I mean, I'm not one of those, you know, uh, Armenian studies should be uh, with Armenian, whatever kind of, I have seen many Russianists who doesn't speak even Russian, but uh, I, I want to just uh, share a poem with you. It's a very, a very um, 
very uh, good one. I, I, like, I, like, I like it very much. So uh, just give me one minute so that I can, it's here, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's called uh, screen, share screen. Okay, uh, lower hand, share screen. It's called Constantinople by, by Wahan Tekeyan. Wahan Tekeyan was one of my uh, best uh, Arm Western Armenian poets who, one of the survivors who left Istanbul on uh, March 1923, just three weeks before the foundation of the Turkish Republic. And uh, six months later uh, in 1924, he wrote this poem. This is the translation for you and I will read the, the Armenian uh, original. Bolis. Ankam mınal tun sevtsar açki sarçev hin bat ger Plurneru meçteren antsnoğ zovun tarts tartsik Vorun gabuydu garne mert zımruhtu yerankner U gorre mert ıspidak ambı ir meç tolatsik O karnan hovun ays çurin hodov ampoğç tatavun İnç bez tetev gıtırçi anmenurek aperun Vıra anor ye partsant vıra tamakin yevamen Gazan nerum meç kaytov Irvot Gerun Hubumen, last two stanzas now. Pajtun, Desilk and Dani, Hima, Einchap Heratat, Use, Iravevor Albidi Yerpek Chupatsvis, Timatsun Uskes Pundro, Im Ansafman Garodis, the last stanza. Tun Voriagar, O Bolis, Luisun Achkerus Norapats, Jiste, Use, Vor Al Menk, Odar Nereng Iraru, Yev Iraun Chunim. Yes, Kuhovit Mech Tagvelu. So uh, Wahan Tekeyan is buried in, in Cairo. Uh, he, he lived uh, in, Cor in Corfu, right? For, for a few years, he wrote uh, a series of poems I shared with Ari in Corfu, and then he went on living in Cairo and he, he, he died in, in Cairo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for listening to this. Thank to you. this. Thank you very much. All right, is that, is that your translation? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I can I can send it to you. Uh, it's I, I guess uh, Gerald Papazian, or uh, there are two different uh, translations, but uh, it is from this uh, this book. I can I can send it to you later. Yeah, that would be great. it's actually a wonderful poem. Yes. Thank you, Ararat, because that that last line. What does it remind you of? It reminds you of Harant Ding's famous line: "We yes. want the land that we will be buried here." Yeah, we want these lands, but to be buried under these lands. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the poem. Um, unfortunately, our time is over now, and we need to conclude here. Um, I want to thank all of you, all the workshop uh, participants, uh, and also the audience for joining us today. Um, thank you very much, and I hope to see you all uh, soon uh, in the near future. Thank you guys. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Naira. Really, really wonderful. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.